Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining. Um, we'll get started in just a few seconds. Um, and uh, as attendees are still joining, we're going to throw up a, a quick poll um, for everybody to tell us which sector within conservation they represent. And so we kind of get a, a sense of who's in the room. So please feel free to respond. Um, and as we're um, getting ready to get started, um, I just wanted to uh, make sure that everybody can hear me. If you can't, um, please use the chat uh, window to let us know if you're having any issues, um, first thing and foremost. And then um, I wanted to thank um, our funders, Grand Victoria Foundation, for supporting this work. And I also wanted to thank you, um, the Prairie State Conservation Coalition, for providing a platform to reach um, conservation practitioners across the state to conduct the study um, that we're going to talk about today on the webinar and share the results of that um, effort. Um, the Delta team that's hosting this webinar includes myself, Olga Leandris, and Riley Mance. Um, we'll be facilitating and tracking questions and making sure that everybody has a smooth experience. And I just wanted to um, mention a few housekeeping items. So I, as I said, you, let's use the chat window um, to type in questions or any comments or concerns. Um, as we go through the webinar. Um, we'll try to keep most of the questions to the end, but um, if there are sort of really quick clarifying questions, we'll, we'll try to address them throughout the webinar. This webinar is being recorded, and so um, we will be sharing the recording with uh, folks um, shortly after the webinar ends. Um, the recording will also be um, hosted on the project website. It will be a, a link to, to YouTube to view it. Um, also, all the materials that we're going to be talking about on the webinar will be available on the project website, um, and we'll share the links in the chat window as well. And towards the end of the webinar, we'll do a quick poll again um, to kind of get everybody's um, reaction uh, and, and feedback, uh, sort of a, a quick scan of the feedback. Um, so as we're going through this, think about where, what interested you, what maybe you wanted to hear more about, um, how you'd like to engage with us in the future to advance um, conservation and stewardship in Illinois. Um, and so it is 11.03, and I'm going to end the poll. Um, and we'll share the results with you just so you guys can see who is in the audience. And, um, okay, cool. We've got a, a lot of conservation land trusts, which is great, um, as well as a uh, mix of folks from other sectors. Um, and so I'm going to go on and introduce the project team who is going to be sort of presenting most of the um, most of the stuff that we had worked on over the past several years and are really the key to the success of this project. Um, we will have uh, Carrie Lee from the Natural Land Institute, Jim Johansson from Joe Davies Conservation Foundation, Lindsay Kinney from Illinois Environmental Council, and Andrew Zwack from Open Lands um, sharing uh, with you some of the results from this project um, and what we learned. Um, and so I think without further ado, I'm going to uh, kick it over to Jim to um, get us started. Uh, Jim, can you unmute yourself? Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yep. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, I wanted to start off today's session just by providing some context, um, not only about the state of Illinois, but also um, the current state of conservation in Illinois. As everybody here, I think, knows, Illinois is known as the Prairie State. We 
We started out with 22 million acres of prairie uh, at the time of European settlement in about 1830. Today, we only have about 2,300 acres of high quality remnant prairie remaining in the state. Um, in all, we have about 1.5 million acres of land, uh, I should say protected land across the state. And this includes both the private sector and the public sector. Uh, when we're speaking about the public sector, uh, we're talking about federal agencies like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, U.S. Forest Service, um, also includes our primary state conservation agency, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, and also local agencies like uh, forest preserve districts and conservation districts. Um, those of you who have been tuned in to conservation in Illinois for the last couple of decades know that our main um, state agency, the Department of Natural Resources, has experienced pretty significant budget cuts over the course of the 2000s. As of 2018, two years ago, the Department of Natural Resources had just over a thousand uh, full-time employees. This was down from 2,300 full-time employees in uh, the year 2001. So we're seeing uh, DNR at less than 50% of the capacity they had uh, nearly 20 years ago. Um, during that time, we also saw the DNR's budget decrease dramatically from about $100 million to just $38 million. The programs that funded conservation flatlined in the year 2015, and a report uh, that was released in, uh, released in March of 2019, put together by the Nature Conservancy, the Illinois Association of Park Districts, and the Trust for Public Land, estimated that the state would need $4.4 billion, billion with a B, to meet its conservation goals. And that includes land acquisition, capital improvements, construction, habitat, et cetera. Um, there's also a large community of conservation land trusts in Illinois. We have over 40 conservation land trusts and other private nonprofit organizations that own and manage land. Um, and that includes about 80,000 acres of uh, fee simple lands owned by these groups as well as conservation easements. In the past, land trusts have often uh, acquired land, restored it, and then turned it over to the public sector for the long-term management. This wasn't always the model that was employed, but it was very, very common. But given the challenges that the uh, state of Illinois faces, both budgetarily and capacity-wise, land trusts are starting to reinvent their role and starting to figure out how they can build their own capacity to steward their own land holdings. So we can't talk about uh, land use and protection of open space in Illinois without mentioning agriculture. We have 71,000 individual farms across the state encompassing 26.6 million acres. The market value for agricultural products in 2012 was 17.2 billion and that ranks the state the seventh in the US for the total value of agricultural products sold, third for crops and second for grains. Uh, what we, one of the things that we tried to understand through the course of this project, and we're going to go into greater detail in just a little bit, is the idea that some of these 26.6 uh, million acres of working lands could be better aligned to help meet the conservation needs um, of both the private and public sectors, and uh, could be used as a catalyst to improve uh, natural land conservation, woodlands, prairies, wetlands, as well as farmland conservation. Because conservation land trusts and the nonprofit sector need to increase their capacity to fund their work in long-term stewardship of the land, our group started by identifying a bunch of different financing strategies and cooperative models that we thought could be used to help meet this stewardship need. Uh, but before we could really dig into those, we realized that we didn't have a comprehensive understanding of stewardship needs across the state of Illinois. And we did a pretty extensive research project to try to understand and map out the current conditions of conservation organization-based stewardship in Illinois. Knowing 
um, the information that came from this research project that positioned us well to help develop some programs and policies to help improve um, uh, the financing and funding of stewardship of natural land across the state. Let's go to the next slide. Thank you. So this, um, this graph shows uh, the, um, uh, the amount of land that uh, the public sector has conserved um, over the last uh, 20 years or so. That solid green um, uh, line graph in the background represents the cumulative number of acres conserved um, over the last uh, 20, 20 some years. Uh, whereas the vertical lighter green uh, bar graphs indicate the uh, total amount of public sender, uh, sector spending on conservation. So what we see here is a pretty clear inverse relationship between the amount of funding that public agencies uh, spent on conservation versus the total number of acres that are held by public agencies. Uh, between 1998 and 2001, over on the left side of this graph, we see that the amount of spending of con on conservation kept pace with the number of new acres that were being acquired by public agencies. But right around 2002, we start to see a reduction in the amount of spending. Um, but while at the same time, public agencies continued to acquire new acres, uh, albeit at a slower pace than before. So the result, as you can see on the right side of the graph, has created an immense stewardship challenge. We've conserved um, more and more acres in the public sector, uh, but at the same time, we've seen less and less and less uh, funding uh, being available to steward those acres. And last but not least, that orange yellow box color um, on the right side of the graph, that represents the time frame that our research project covered. So the information you're going to see on the following slides uh, covers uh, the last 10 years or so. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we wanted to dig into that previous information just a little bit, um, a little bit more. What this shows is um, the rate of transfer of land from the private sector to the public sector. As I mentioned earlier, one of the classic um, models used by conservation land trusts and other nonprofits that work in conservation has been to acquire land, um, sometimes doing some restoration in the interim and then transferring that land to a public agency. And then that public agency would then be responsible for the long-term stewardship of the land. This model worked extremely well. Um, you can see in the top graph about 77 percent of all acres that were acquired by land trusts were at some point transferred to a public agency uh, for the long-term management and stewardship. And that's about over the last 50 years or so. Um, in contrast, um, we see only about 16 percent of acres that were acquired by land trusts being transferred to a public agency over the last 10 years or so. Um, and this, we, we hypothesize that this shift is uh, due to a number of factors, one of which is um, uh, the decreased availability of funding in the, in the public sector has uh, decreased the capacity of the public sector to then take on the management and stewardship responsibilities associated with accepting um, accepting these acres from, from the Conservation Land Trust community. Um, and the result has been that um, as fewer acres are being transferred from the private sector over to the public sector, the private sector has um, taken on more and more of the, uh, uh, the responsibility associated with long-term stewardship. Next slide. So this, uh, 
this work also built on some previous work that um, a subset of this group had undertaken in the last couple of years. Um, we know that land stewardship is going to be a challenge for uh, land trusts as well as the public sector, but we didn't quite understand how big of a challenge we were dealing with um, in terms of meeting the needs of stewardship. Because conservation land trusts need to increase their capacity and fund their work around long-term management of the land, we started our work by identifying a bunch of different financing strategies as well as cooperative models that we think could be used to increase stewardship capacity. Um, now that we have a, a better understanding of the stewardship needs across the state, um, we're going to talk about some of the programs and policies we're proposing could be used to improve uh, improve the stewardship of natural land across the state. And with that, I think I'm going to hand it over to Carrie Lee. Carrie, don't forget to unmute yourself. Thank you, Jim. That was um, a good background. So um, one of the things that we looked at a little bit deeper, we took a deeper dive into the capacity uh, that conservation land trusts had. And um, we had uh, out of over 40 conservation land trusts in the state of Illinois, we had about 24, uh, we had 24 groups who responded to this survey. So all of this data um, is from that, um, those survey respondents. So when we started to look at capacity, we wanted to say who's already involved in doing, in doing stewardship activities within these conservation land trusts. And you'll see on the, on the axis along the bottom that we've got a continuum of everyone from volunteers, contractors, the board, the executive director, all the way to the fundraising director, which is a little bit of a surprise to me, who participated uh, in stewardship activities at their, uh, at their organization. And the volunteers uh, really represent 50% of all stewardship hours. I, I wasn't too surprised about that because in our organization, um, we've been tracking volunteer hours uh, for quite a while and we have um, about, uh, about two full-time people uh, represented in volunteer hours and about half of those are stewardship hours. So we can say that our volunteers, for example, at the Natural Land Institute are equivalent to having a full-time person on staff. So that's pretty impressive, you know, and I, I, I think volunteers are really a mainstay uh, of a lot of organizations. But we also notice that contractors play a really prominent role in stewardship implementation um, because they can provide skilled labor and, and equipment uh, when we need them. Um, whereas staff often, they have to prioritize their other work that they do, um, as well as their day-to-day -day implementation of stewardship rather than activities that a contractor can come in and just um, do a, a sort of discrete project. So one of the other things that we noticed was that in smaller organizations and we, throughout the study, we measured small, medium, and large organizations according to how many acres they had. So smaller organizations were uh, zero to 500 acres, mid-size organizations are 500 to 2,000 acres, and large organizations are over 2,000 acres in their land holdings, not necessarily what they've protected because as was pointed out before, a lot of that land got transferred to other agencies. So in these smaller organizations, uh, executive directors and boards are really very highly engaged in these stewardship activities. 
and that includes getting out there as boots in the boots on the ground you know they uh, really um, participate in a effective way and as organizations grow and in the larger larger organizations the executive director and the boards then have more time to focus on things like priority setting and fundraising and running the organization. And conservation organizations, interestingly, seem not to grow their capacity to acquire and manage additional land. So why is that? Specifically, organizations that manage under 2,000 acres a year typically stay under 2,000 acres a year. And that's due to constraints in capital and in labor. So annual labor costs for small and mid-size organizations are relatively consistent at approximately $215,000, with labor costs increasing to $641,000 for larger organizations. So Olga, you can... Um, go to the next slide yes thank you Carrie and um, I should mention that all uh, you can kind of explore this data uh, and look at all the numbers that Carrie had mentioned um, on the project website where there are there's the full report with all the graphics as well as sort of interactive data visuals where you can um, look at the data in ways that might be of interest to you so um, now switching gears a little bit to uh, partnerships, which was another big section of the study that we focused on because we sort of had a sense that partnering with other organizations is a critical component of increasing organizational capacity to do stewardship. So in the survey, we asked respondents to, um, to let us know who they work with and how they work with um, org other organizations in the state. Um, so we asked about the partnership structure, formal, informal, whether it includes um, cooperative agreements, MOUs, et cetera. Um, we asked what kind of activities these partnerships involve, um, ranging from things like you know, applying for grants together to sharing data and volunteers or equipment. Um, and we asked also how long these partnerships have been active. And so, you know, I'll give you just a little preview of what we found. Um, the majority of the reported partnerships were considered informal, and practitioners emphasized um, the importance of individual relationships over institutional relationships in maintaining these, these partnerships. Um, and, uh, you know, it looks like that has really proved successful because um, within the conservation community, many of the partnerships um, that we you know, captured in the study really have um, an average of over 15 years of duration. So they do have staying power within the conservation community. And when people find sort of uh, ways to work together, they continue to work together, um, which sort of suggests that having these partnerships be strengthened and um, more extensive should be a helpful thing to, to improve um, the conservation community's ability to steward the land, the protected land. And so if you go to the project website, um, you can explore in more detail what partnerships are active and what attributes they have. Um, we created a network diagram where which you see a screenshot of here um, right now. It's, it's also interactive and you can explore different aspects of the network. Um, here you can sort of get a little taste of it. The green circles are all the land trusts that um, were you know, captured in our survey. And the size of the circle is proportional to the number of partnerships that that organization reported. So you see some some have quite a few partnerships, um, but not all. Um, and then the other circle colors represent different types of organizations that are partners. And those, um, you could, there's a legend here. Um, you could see that those include, 
you know, volunteer groups, um, service cooperatives, foundations, government um, entities, um, and other types of organizations that partnerships um, are formed with. And so I think this information can be really helpful to the conservation community. If we can better understand the structure of the network, we can link it to the function of the network. And in particular, of course, we're interested in, in seeing how we can better leverage these partnerships um, to increase the capacity to implement stewardship. Um, so, you know, we can use this information to answer questions like which organizations help diffuse information and other resources throughout the network, which organizations serve, serve as bridges between others, um, and, you know, things like that. We'll be hosting a session to talk about this in more detail at the Vital Land Summit that's coming up in January 30th and 31st in Champaign. And so um, we'll, we'll provide some details about that later on, and we hope you can join us. Um, and I also wanted to say one more thing about this data set and what we can learn from it. It's, it's not complete. We have... Um, said um, that we got 30, um, 24 responses uh, from the, the 40 or so organizations, conservation land trusts that are operating in the state. And so <clears throat> that, that means that we definitely didn't capture all the partnerships that are active. Um, and we encourage you to check out the project website um, and the network map in particular, and you can um, add you know, if you don't see yourself captured on this map and the partnerships that you're involved in, you can fill out um, a quick Google form to provide that information and we can add you to the map. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Andrew to talk about the funding aspect related to stewardship. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Andrew Schwach, Manager of Governmental Affairs at Open Lands. Um, I'm going to take you quickly through some of the funding research that uh, we all compiled, um, some policy insights, and then kick it back over to folks working on tools to implement some of the ideas that we found. Um, what you're looking at right now is a chart that represents the different funding sources that land trusts reported uh, receiving for stewardship activities. Um, and I kind of see these breaking down into three main categories that, that are a little more easily digestible. Um, the first category uh, to me represents our bedrock, you know, individual fundraising and foundations um, support 21 of the 24 land trusts that responded to our survey. And I know many of the folks on this call are responsible for this support and um, either as foundation representatives or individual donors themselves. And I just uh, want to say thank you <laughs> and please keep it up. Uh, your support uh, really does sustain this work and, and we'll continue to look for new and innovative ways to leverage the money that you invest in us in our natural areas. Um, moving slightly down the page, the, the second category here uh, represents more traditional funding sources that uh, have historically sustained stewardship. Uh, but face either uncertain futures or are not as available to all of the Illinois land trusts as we might like them to be. Um, federal programs, especially those housed under the um, U.S. Department of Agricultural, Fish, and Wildlife Service, uh, are maybe not as reliable as they once were. Um, numerous land trusts also express some uncertainty um, about how their endowments and investments might hold up uh, if they had to shoulder the burdens of stewardship funding over extended periods of time and consequently only about half of land trusts use them to fund stewardship, um, in part due to management costs and concerns of that nature. Um, I'll also tax state government resources onto this list. As Jim mentioned before, they, they have taken a significant hit in the past decade or so, um, but we do hope that they'll get a shot in the arm from the natural area stewardship grants, which are allowed here pretty soon. Um, and I know also many of our friends from IDNR are on the call, Again, can't thank them enough for what they do, uh, and we hope to keep them very busy. <laughs> we hope all of the land trusts avail themselves of uh, the chance to apply for the stewardship grants once that program is up and running. Um, at the bottom here, we've got a couple uh, funding sources that we're terming a little bit non-traditional um, that hold a lot of promise but may not be familiar to everyone. Um, and, and very, very high level here, uh, working lands income is something that our group has proposed as a source of stewardship money. 
uh, but concerns do abound about uh, regarding available technical expertise to get this type of income stream up and running and, and its ability to be scaled uh, to the level of an organization. Same goes for market mechanisms, which is a little bit of a catch-all category. Um, and there's also real opportunity I'll mention in the um, uh, perceived by land trusts to take advantage of local government relationships that they have and, and attract skin in the game from, from some of those folks. Um, so again, very high level, happy that there's tons of details in the reports and we'd be happy to discuss more offline, but I can go to the next slide, which um, moves us on to policy tools that land trusts use. Uh, and sort of really, really quick, what these percentages represent is what percentage of land trust respondents use these different policy incentives. So the first one, the, the one that most of us use, 83% uh, use our uh, nonprofit status to exempt us from property taxation. Um, not all, but, but, but most of us do this. Um, and where blanket exemption may not be available for this type of thing, uh, such as on privately owned parcels, parcels that generate farming, hunting, uh, or other revenues, uh, land trusts can, uh, many land trusts, most, no, not quite most, um, land trusts take advantage of special assessment categories like those for Illinois nature preserves, land and water reserves, um, and uh, far fewer, 8% of us, the, the Forestry um, Development Act designation. Um, to a lesser extent, land trusts use federal CRP and Illinois CSP, uh, the Conservation Stewardship Program. Um, it, but we're talking, you know, less than 30% of us have navigated that process successfully, which represents a real, uh, I'll call it an opportunity for land trusts to work more cooperatively uh, with government agencies that manage these programs. Um, and the good news there, something else that's come out from, from our surveys is that land trusts do want to um, engage with policymakers in a more concerted way. Uh, but we could use a little more clear and consistent direction and advice on how to get, engage with that, either the legislative process or the rulemakings behind these potential funding programs. Um, something else that, again, doesn't appear on the screen that, that um, we do want to mention is that there's a very frequently perceived uh, fear of backlash from either uh, removing a protected parcel from the tax rolls and stewarding it. Um, <laughs> but like so much in the, in the political arena, we're looking at mostly smoke and mirrors uh, created by uh, those who would oppose some of the work that we do. In actuality, we found that the risk of actually experiencing substantive backlash to protecting lands and um, very importantly, uh, responsibly stewarding them is really very small. Most organizations receive little or no actual substantive pushback from doing what we do especially if the properties that we own and manage are stewarded well. Um, and the last slide, uh, before kicking it back over to, um, to Carrie, I'll just sort of read straight from the report. Uh, and here's the text on the slide. We're observing a cultural shift among our organizations, boards and, and leadership, as we, we confront the need to diversify um, funding strategies and, and really look at the long term. Um, creating opportunities to experiment a little bit. And um, we're talking about upstate, downstate, and, and everywhere in between. Um, organizations looking at um, some more a whole holistic approach in building in things like community engagement into our stewardship, watershed planning, bringing some of those resources to bear. Um, and to that end, we, we kind of wanted to present to you folks some of the tools that some of our land trusts have been working on and, and some of our other partners in this work as well. I, I'll give a very high overview of what that is and then let um, the folks who are doing that work take, take it the rest of the way. Um, Lindsay and the team at uh, Illinois Environmental Council have put together a civics for environmentalists uh, guidance, um, which she'll get into a little later. Um, Olga and her team have made a, a matrix that uh, includes a suite of different financing strategies um, for conservation, ranging from public grants, tax incentives, um, leveraging private investments, and, and pretty much the whole, the, whole, um, the whole suite of different things that we found out there. Um, but now I'd like to uh, bring back Carrie Lee from the Natural Land Institute, who's um, piloted a working lands program that brings together the ag and conservation communities. 
Um, and, and she's got a, a case study that sort of can serve as a blueprint for the rest of us as, as we look at how we can um, pursue this working lands angle. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so that's been, we've done a really good um, kind of overview of the study results. And so now we're moving into an overview of the tools that we've prepared. And um, one, so one of the tools, as Andrew said, is this um, working lands concept of, of kind of taking a look at how alternative sources of income could fund our stewardship activities. And we also wanted to say, hey, what would be compatible with our mission? So we dove in and as part of our explorations, we came up with these three reports. So the first one is the first report on the, uh, I'm not quite ready for that slide, but that's okay. The first one is, on the left side of your screen is the, um, the process document that we put forward where our board took a leap of faith in moving forward with this concept of the farm as natural habitat. And I had a book that really kicked me off with this idea a few years ago, and I'm going to put that uh, reference in the chat for you when I'm done. Um, the farm as natural habitat, reconnecting food systems with ecosystems. So we jumped in and uh, produced that report. We also did a financial analysis of how feasible is this for moving uh, from into using this kind of model. And then we also took a look at one particular farm in depth. So now we can go to the next slide because I'm gonna just share with you a little bit about each of these um, three reports. Um, so the, the first report was, is our kind of process report. And this is the process that our board and staff went through to kind of figure out, is this something we wanna do? How do we do it? What's involved? What do we need to learn? Uh, and then what are the implications, for example, for a conservation land trust? holding agricultural land. And we, so we were donated, all this kind of came up, we were donated a farm about five years ago um, from four brothers who were all in their 90s and they um, wanted to make sure that their farm uh, was either kept as a conservation farm because it had been farmed using conservation practices uh, for the last 40 years or it could go into and be restored to habitat. Um, but they had several children amongst them and those kids were not interested in that particularly. So they knew the farm would probably be sold for whatever they could get for it. So we decided to take some agricultural land. And now historically, our conservation land has never, as the Natural Land Institute, we, didn't, we had turned down agricultural land in the, in the past before I was the executive director. So this was really a new thing for us to take a look at. And how, what are the implications for conservation land trust in terms of uh, expanding our preserves and creating connectivity and large ecological complexes? Because one of the things that we really realized was that we can no longer just preserve these little small little museum pieces um, of habitat and ecosystems, um, but that we needed to really take a look at how these systems or these small museum like pieces of high quality habitat fit into the broader landscape. So we also had to learn what does that mean for healthy soils, carbon sequestration, uh, water quality, increasing bird habitat, pollination, plants, pollinator plants, and all of that. So we very quickly began to see through our journey of learning and experimenting and working with our farmers 
that um, this really fit in to very well with our overall uh, mission. Um, so I think we can move to the next slide. So one of the things that we needed to learn a little bit about also was what are the kind of financial imp implications for moving a farm from typical commodity agriculture uh, of corn and soybeans for a farmer to begin to use conservation farming practices. So we wanted to start there. And so we also, so we hired through the grant, through the um, funding from this grant, uh, HIFE partners to do a research project, taking a look at the financial implications for the farmer and for us to kind of move from uh, what they were doing into conservation farming practices, what would it take if they moved into regenerative agricultural practices or into organic farming practices. And what we discovered along this journey was that there are a lot of different definitions of regenerative agriculture out there. Uh, and that also organic farming practices uh, can be really destructive to the soil because for weed control, for example, instead of using chemicals uh, they, or other practices, um, they till the soil constantly, tilling the soil. So that has a real effect on the carbon and the organic matter in the soil. So there was no one real easy answer for us. We were, ta were taking a look at gradually evolving our farmers. Uh, and so we engaged the soils consultant to work with our farmers um, to assist them with transitioning to using cover crops, conservation farming practices, and also things like soil biologicals um, so that they could, could take a look at the equipment they had, what do they need to do differently, and so each farmer did like a small portion of the farm. So um, one farm had, we have 200 acres, uh, 400 acres in tillable land, they just took 30 acres and did an experiment so that we're gradually moving our farmers. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So the third report was where we, we engaged um, another consultant who did these whole farm plans, uh, conservation plans, uh, to do a deep dive into one of our farms. And this farm uh, has not only agricultural land on it, it's got a stream that goes through it, it's got woodlands, uh, and it's had a lot of CRP prairie on it. And one of the things that they found um, was that there are competing priorities at the farm because we had developed a management plan and that our long-term goals of eventual ecological restoration were conflicting with our uh, short-term strategies for revenue generation. And basically what they said is that you can have long-term revenue generation with strategies that are not conflicting with your priorities for, for perhaps potential, potential restoration of this site. So the, what they decided uh, in conversation with us and our, our, our uh, working land subcommittee was that these conflicting priorities needed a unifying goal to bring them together. And that unifying goal they recommended was soil health. So, so focusing on soil health leads to strategies that for us will produce returns for, for not only us, but also the producer. And that improve stewardship in terms of land and water quality. And that will lead to or begin to incorporate restoration practices on the farm. So these soil health practices include, for example, 
uh, reducing the loss of nitrogen by incorporating split spring applications rather than a fall in a spring application, reducing soil erosion, using cover crops and no-till, the use of buffers in grassed water, waterways, and other nutrient loss reduction strategies. So basically any farm, large or small, uh, with conventional organic producing grain, produce or livestock can employ sustainable management protect practices. And these are those conservation practices that protect soil health within this whole concept of an agroecological landscape. So that was, that was another concept for us to wrap our heads around and that we can minimize the risk as well as protect, protecting our producers long-term profitability. And we have been really lucky because the two farmers that we have uh, working on our farms are really eager. Uh, one of the farmers said, you know, I've always wanted to learn about this. I just didn't know how to do it. So having uh, that consultant that we hired work with them directly um, has been a real boon. So the um, sustainable, um, these sustainable agricultural practices uh, also uh, were looking at how they provide ecosystem services to the region, um, as well as protecting the long-term health and productivity of the land. So we developed um, really a um, set of guiding principles and a policy, and the guiding principles that we developed which are part of this project, and you can see those in our report. Uh, principle one is sustainable land stewardship. Principle two is that we have mutually beneficial lease arrangements because <clears throat> if we want our farmers to do conservation practices, we need to maybe reduce our, um, our lease arrangement fee for them per acre so that they can afford to do some of these things. Uh, and conservation and restoration, so that uh, initial conservation practices would include marginal lands, remaining habitat remnants, stream corridors, et cetera, et cetera. And the fourth principle we have is that farms can be assessed as to their economic potential for valuing the ecosystem services which they provide, such as carbon sequestration, uh, as well as potential for local food production, specialty crops, conservation grazing, as long as they fit within the policy that we developed. But our intention was to demonstrate that ecologically managed ag lands are profitable and improve our, our region's natural resources. So as we move forward, uh, we're gonna be building on this pilot work uh, and uh, developing a business model for a working lands program for both individual organizations and as a financing mechanism for the stewardship cooperative that's been taking shape in Northwest Illinois for the last three or four years. So the Natural Land Institute will focus on implementing the, these conservation plan recommendations. Uh, so we have another, in the next phase, we have another contract with Solutions in the Land to dig even deeper from their recommendations from their preliminary report. We're gonna be making lease updates to incentivize conservation and to have conservation practices in our lease. Uh, and procedures uh, for our working lands program, including deciding what to monitor what can we monitor, what's meaningful to monitor, how to monitor, and that the, the results of that will inform the broader program development and design. So at the moment, we're looking, we're working with Delta and um, other partners to take a look and say, you know, what are meaningful things for us to measure and monitor? So one of the things is we want to really look at um, how we're growing the organic matter in our soil and um, how our soil, ha soil health is progressing and what water quality benefits are we doing as well as habitat. 
So thank you. You can read a lot more uh, about these uh, three reports. Um, there's lots to delve into, and I hope you enjoy your read. Thanks, Carrie. This is this is Lindsay Keeney. Uh, I'm the conservation director at the Illinois Environmental Council. Um, and in addition to Carrie's fantastic working lands case study, we developed a couple additional tools um, within this project. And these came uh, from the interviews. They were uh, kind of gaps in our collective knowledge as a conservation community. Um, so we developed these tools to kind of bridge those gaps. And Andrew mentioned this first one, this conservation funding matrix, um, when he was speaking about funding. Um, and I think the biggest takeaway I'd like you to take from this is that you should really get on to the website um, and explore these tools yourself. They are, Olga talked a little bit about how they're interactive. Um, she has some really great Tableau software and you can um, do searches and do uh, manipulate this data and these different variables in a way that makes sense for um, your organization and what you're trying to find or uncover um, or explore uh, in a way that makes sense for you. So we put together this matrix and it's a suite of financing strategies for conservation and it ranges from public grant dollars to tax incentives to mechanisms that leverage private investment dollars. Um, and the graphic shows the various types of funding uh, that's utilized for conservation and you can filter it by several variables that and find options that are applicable to you and your organization. Um, you can organize it by funding mechanism, by funding strategy, uh, scalability, applicability to your organization. And then the coolest part is all of these, um, if you can see this big long list, uh, each of those has links uh, to examples or to the to that specific resource. So you can follow the link and it'll link out to the website or the resource uh, so you can see that firsthand um, resource. So then the next tool that we developed on the next slide uh, came from the interviews where we would speak with land trust and we would hear that um, we're a little lost in how we interact with our decision makers um, and how we start to get involved in civics and advocating for uh, policies that help our community. Uh, so we developed this Civics for Environmentalists guide. Uh, please download it, check it out, keep it. Um, and this came from interviewees expressing a lack of understanding of their own power in Springfield and knowledge about how to get involved. So hopefully this will serve to strengthen partnerships with decision makers, help us uh, as the Illinois Environmental Council, but also the conservation community build relationships with lawmakers and you guys are conservation experts. Um, the guide covers a lot. You can see kind of the table of contents here on the left. Um, some of the big things and things that we've been asked a lot um, and that IEC covers a lot is clarifying what activities count as lobbying under your 501c3 or under your 501c4, uh, the basics of following a bill into the law, uh, what sort of things you can legally do um, that are either lobbying or not quite lobbying and you can do as much as it as you'd like, um, and then how you can influence the process of policy at different uh, parts of the process. So whether that's rulemaking at an agency level and weighing in on that process or coming to Springfield to advocate for a specific bill or uh, weighing in on the language of a bill and crafting a bill in the very early stages. So this is just uh, kind of a big overview um, of all of that information. And as always, IEC is a resource for this information and anyone on this project team can, can help you out if you have questions. Um, and if you want more information on this, I have a shameless plug later on. We have a uh, upcoming webinar that's just on civics for environmentalists. So I'd encourage you to uh, attend that as well. And I think you can go to the next slide and I'll turn it back over to Olga. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, this is great. Um, so <clears throat> we hope that uh, we've piqued your interest in the results that we shared today. 
Um, and, you know, the challenges that conservation land trusts face in doing stewardship as well as helpful resources. Um, innovative strategies to finance conservation in the state of Illinois. And so where do we go from here? Um, we really want to continue sharing the study findings with the community so it can be used to inform decisions about resourcing and building capacity for long-term land stewardship. Based on what we heard in the surveys and during the interviews that were conducted throughout this process, it seems like there's a great opportunity um, to strengthen partnerships and engage more with decision makers to ensure that policies are in place that support conservation efforts. And um, we're also currently working, as um, Carrie had mentioned, on building out the business model for a working lands program so that it can be, we can use farmland in Illinois to support land stewardship um, as, we, as we move forward. Um, we'd also like to hear from you um, what, what is of interest and where are the opportunities to work together for us to improve the ability of conservation land trusts to steward the natural lands in the state. Um, and so we're going to do a quick poll right now for everybody on the line to provide some feedback on the contents of the webinar um, and how you'd like to stay engaged. And um, as uh, people are answering the poll questions, I can skip over to the next slide um, as well to, to just uh, summarize all the upcoming events and workshops that we have planned where we'll continue discussions about this project findings and the tools. And um, here it is for you to see all the, the data and the study results and the tools um, are online at uh, stewardship.delta-institute.org. You can go there and check it out. Um, we, have, we will be at the, final, uh, the Vital Lands uh, Illinois Summit talking about partnerships um, Prairie State Conservation Coalition annual meeting. We'll dive deeper into the, the tools. Um, we'll host a few vital land sessions, so similar to this kind of online webinar um, style sessions to talk about capacity and conservation leasing. We hope to also engage folks um, not just in the northern part of the state, but um, uh, talk um, with the Downstate Caucus of, of Climate Table, um, focusing on policy. Um, and then, as Lindsay had already mentioned, there's a Civics for Environmentalists workshop that's coming up. It will be held in person in Chicago, but you can also join via webinar. And we'll post all the links to all these events um, that, are, that have the dates and locations set um, in the chat window for everybody to to access easily, um, as well as the link to the website. And then we plan to do another webinar sort of like this, but closing out this project at the end of the summer and share sort of what we learned through this process um, in the past nine months or so. Um, with that, so I'll give folks just a few more seconds to finish the poll. Um, and then I wanted to put the contact information for all of us here so everybody can see and definitely encourage you to reach out to us if you want to discuss any of the things that we presented on this webinar more and would like more information. Um, and take, we have just a few minutes for questions. Um, if people are typing in to, their, to the chat window, um, we can do that really quickly. So, okay, I'm going to end the poll. Um, and then really quickly see what kind of questions have come up for everybody. It looks like there is a, a book recommendation called Wilding by Isabella Tree um, that we can maybe share with all the all the attendees. I thank you to Bill Davidson for that. Um, if there are any more questions that come up as you guys are sort of thinking about what we presented here, definitely feel free to reach out. Um, 
One final uh, thank you to everybody for attending, to the project team that has presented today and has worked on this over the past several years, um, to the Grand Victoria Foundation for funding this work, and another uh, shout out to Ben Shirovsky, who is a former uh, Delta colleague who kind of started this whole uh, project before I um, got involved. So thank you to Ben. Um, and I think we want to be respectful of everybody's time um, and end um, as we promised at noon. Um, it doesn't look like 